west of the Rockies. You're on the air. Hello. Art Bell? Yes, turn your radio off, please. Okay, I'm in my uh, cellular. I'm rolling into Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, my name is Pete. Okay. Uh, I listen to you every morning on the way to work, and uh, I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time. See, I had my car in the shop, and I had a show car getting paid and uh, painted, and it was in the shop for three years. Three years? For three years, it was in the shop. Getting so, painted? Wait a minute. You had yeah. a car in the shop three years getting painted? Yeah, it was a show car. So anyway... What, was somebody doing this with a with a toothpick? No, it, it was all custom. Everything was <sighs> torn good. apart. I but see. But that's not the point where I'm calling you. What I'm calling you was, I saw this UFO sitting on the top of this plateau, and I used to drive to this body shop 30 miles from Albuquerque South, and that's the time... When those cows were getting mutilated that time, you know, and the government would, couldn't figure out what was going on. Yeah, it was in all the papers there. Right. Okay. Me and my wife had gone down to the body shop that day. We didn't see nothing that, that day. On the way back, we were coming towards uh, Albuquerque, and we looked up to the left, and there was this big, huge craft. It looked like a, it was big as a mall. And my wife said, look at that. And I pulled over, and we lo looked at it for a while, and I said, God, that is unbelievable. Well, that's quite but, exciting. Well, well, let's get off and walk over there. She goes, uh-uh, I'm not going over there. I'm not about to get dissected. But that thing was so huge. Yeah, you know, wives are usually smarter. Yeah. But this is the truth. Every time I, I talk to somebody about it, they, they say I'm crazy or something, you know. And me and my wife are the only ones that have seen this. And at that time. Is, your, is your wife with you? No, we're That's separated now. Oh, I see. I have a different wife now. Oh, I but, see. But anyway, that time when, uh, okay, just before that, that helicopter had blew up with all them troops in it. I don't know if you remember it. It was on the news. Well, I, I remember a number of incidents. Yeah, well, uh, my, my mom and my sister were coming back from Tucson at that time. But why do you connect one with the other? What does that well, have to do with it? The reason her? why I didn't co tell the government about it because I was scared to get, you know, because they had came to my house and questioned my mom up and down. Well, I think I may have the answer if you'll just listen on the air. Obviously, um, I have never heard of any paint job that takes three years. And they took so long in painting your car that obviously some sort of time distortion developed. I mean, I don't care what they were doing. There's no way on God's green earth that the best of custom work can take three years. It is in itself a giant time distortion. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Yes, um, how are you, Mr. Bell? I've been listening. I'm, my name is uh, Sla. I'm calling from Brooklyn, New York. So your name is Sla? Yes, Sla. That's a very unusual name. It's West African. Yes. Okay. Anyway, um, the Department of Energy has, I know you have these guests on your show talking about alien technology, but they have alien technology that we can use the water in the ocean as an energy. They, they have a function. In, uh, There's no proof of this, though. They, well, problem. of course, they're not going to say it exists because they, they don't want um, uh, foreign countries to copy the technology, so they're going to they deny its existence. But they have hydrogen fusion technology from alien craft that has been secured on the ground subterranean. Hmm. Well, I hope you're right. Well, you have these guests on your show, Mr. Bell, so I'm, I'm sure it doesn't sound... I awful. do, but none of them have proven to me that underground somewhere lies, you know, alien technology There's, that will save us from the whole... There's no way they're going to bring you the documented proof. The government will not allow this information. Well, anyway, they have... Okay, minus that proof, then, why do you believe this? I, I read the book. There's a book called Behold the Pale Horse yeah, that yeah, yeah. documents these subterranean... Uh, alien propulsion systems that the government has. Yeah, you yeah. see what they're waiting for? They're waiting for the world to reach a point where it's like anarchy. But, yep, no, but this is this is one of the reasons why they uh, they did the assault weapons ban. They want to take the weapons away with the New World Order conspiracy with the United Nations and certain elements within the government. And then they want to go into the third world and take all their resources. And take all the stuff away from the poor people. <laughs> Alien technology, huh? Buried in the ground, just waiting for the moment. Well, again, I hope so, but I wouldn't bet my butt on it. 
Uh, and I don't think you ought to bet yours either. It would be nice. It really would be nice. But I just don't think it's so. And I don't think there's any proof. And short of that proof, we have to operate as though it's not there. Wild card line, you're on the air. Hello. Art. Yes. Hi, this is Susan from California. Hi, Susan. How are you? Fine. Um, I have a altered state dimensional experience I wanted to talk to you about. By all means. Okay. Um, I was living in a little town called Llano in uh, New Mexico. It's halfway between Santa Fe and Taos. Mm -hmm. And um, it was in 1998, and I was um, meditating. I'd gotten my kids to sleep. I was meditating, and um, I started having the feeling of, um, like, things circling above my bed. Um, Not nothing, you know, just kind of like, you know, spirits circling my bed. And I thought, wow, that's pretty interesting. And the next thing you know, I thought I saw a light coming down our dirt road, and I got up to look out, you know, a big bay window, and the next thing you know, I'm standing on the road to my house, uh-huh. and coming up to me is um, this very tall, attractive, looks human man, except um, his hair looks metallic, and um, he tells me that he wants me to come with him, but it's not kind of, we're not talking, we're having conversation in another place. Mm-hmm. And um, he tells me he wants me to come with him, and I tell him, well, you know, I, I don't want to. I, my daughter is young. What if you don't bring me back? And he said, no, come on. And he tried to convince me, and finally I said, no, I'm not going. And he said, okay, what if we bring your daughter? I said, okay, fine. So the next thing you know, um, my daughter is there. We're standing, like, on this mound. There was an old mound um, from building adobes, and it was grown over, and we're standing on top of the mound, and the next thing you know, I have the sensation of moving, but my hair is not blowing. There's no wind in my face, mm-hmm. and I'm sitting, and I, you know, kind of feel down, and there's nothing underneath me, but uh-huh. I have the sensation of moving. And you know how the screensaver looks on the, on your computer, like the stars whizzing by? It looks sure. like that. The next thing you know, there's a starburst, two starbursts in the sky, and they have wavy kind of lines in them, um, like a sunburst, you know, like if two little suns. But mm-hmm. not bright like a sun, just, you know, these little openings with wavy lines in them. And we pop in there and pop out the other side. And it was like being in a plane, and there was some cloud cover. And then it was like under the clouds there was um, a place. And there was, as we were coming in, there was lots of orange glow, like I knew they were fighting, like a war or something. I wasn't real sure, but I wasn't frightened at all. Right. And... um Then he said, um, you know, that we were going to, he had to prepare, you know, let other people know that we were there. So when we first got there, just to be kind of still and wait until he had squared everything away and then, you know, um, everything would be okay. And so we got there and I was raised on an Air Force base, so I'm pretty familiar with hangars and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And it was, a we came into like what was a hangar, a big, you know, open spaced um, building and we had flown by these three triangular uh, glass buildings. It was very strange. I remember thinking it must have been like a United Nations or something because there were flags, like a whole bunch of flagpoles and different um, flags in front. I thought, well, that's strange. So we get in the... Um, well, you must have been in some kind of altered state because I, whether your daughter was there or not, I mean, you've got to agree. It would be unusual to agree to simply go with somebody in the middle of the night. Oh, no, he was very charismatic. I'll tell you what, if he came, <laughs> I haven't seen him since, but if he came back tonight, you go gone. along tonight, I'm, huh? I'm gone. <laughs> yeah, he was fabulous. So anyway, we got there. Um, my, uh, my daughter, we were kind of standing behind these shelves. And someone else came up, and my daughter thought that she knew him, and she jumped out and started talking to him. And the gentleman turned around, and it was like, oh, you have to go back now. And I said, what do you mean? You were going to tell me something. And he said, no, you have to go back. And I was very disappointed. And then I realized we were going back, and he wasn't with us, and I got a little frightened. And I heard a giggle, you know, and he threw me something that looked like a Nintendo controller and said, here, have some fun. And the next thing I know, I'm playing with the thing, and we're, there's one straight road between um, Santa Fe and Taos, and you can tell it's, you know, tall trees. We're above the tree line, and I'm playing with a little controller. I thought it was fun, and we were skipping up and down. And the next thing, I'm in my bed, and my son is screaming from downstairs, running up the stairs into my bedroom on fire, screaming, Mom, Mom, there's been something in the field for over an hour. 
He said, it grows green, glows green like my fish bait. And he said, I don't know what it is. He said, I think it's an ET. I couldn't move in my bed. Wow. So we got up and, and I got up and calmed him down. And, you know, it, it took way into the wee hours of the morning to calm him down. That morning, my daughter wanders down from upstairs, and she says to me, Mom, how'd you like flying around with those angels last night? <laughs> All right, listen, that's where we have to hold it. I really, really appreciate your call, and that's exactly the kind of thing I was after tonight. We're talking about, well, what you just heard, people who, in a conscious state, have gone to what appears to be, for lack of a better phrase, another universe, another reality. That's another word that's been bouncing around tonight. From Manila in the Philippines, I'm Art Bell. Uh, east of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hi. Hi there. Are you doing, Art? I'm doing okay. This is Kate, right? Yes. Excellent, Kate. Um, what can you tell us? Well, I'm listening to you from KNZR, Bakersfield, California. Ah, uh, yes. Um, I worked on in Michelson Lab on China Lake Naval Base in oh. the late 70s. Oh. And with what everybody's talking about, the stem cell research and the gen- Neticists dying and the microbiologists. Um, I knew one of these days I would be telling this story, and I feel it is necessary to do so right now. Well, it's true. I mean, we have. I've had I don't know how many stories about dead microbiologists. Now, maybe somehow the media just decided to start focusing on dead microbiologists, but it seems like there have been so many stories, Kate, that there's something to it. Or am I wrong? No, you're definitely correct. Um, definitely. And, um, it's none too soon coming. It's, it should have been out long time ago, but you know how the government is. They don't want to talk about anything, but you know, we're going to find out, you know, there are those of us who look into these things and we're very determined and tenacious people. Yes. Well, you sound like it. Uh, Oh, you betcha, honey. You (laughs) definitely am. (laughs) You you worked at China Lake. Yes, I did, sir, in the late 70s after I graduated from high school. Doing what? Um, I was working on the cruise missile project. Oh. I was a systems analyst and, you know, basically just analyzing all of the information for the uh, missile. And they had Tomahawk and Sidewinder out there also. Uh-huh. And um, the almost two years that I was working on the project, uh, three days after starting at the lab, um, I met a gentleman who... Um, had an office down the way from mine, and I walked around in the first three days and said hello to everybody and introduced myself, and this gentleman was coming out of his office, and I I knew by the nameplate that his name was Roger, so I yelled down, and I said, Roger, how are you? Good morning, and he didn't stop, and I thought, okay, uh, maybe he didn't hear me. You know, maybe he has a hearing disability or something. So I kind of hurried behind him and tapped him on the shoulder, and I said, Roger, how are you doing today? My name is Kate. I just started. I just wanted to, you know, introduce myself. And he turned and looked at me, and you could see in his face, his name was not Roger, to start off the story there. So over the next few months, I made friends with Roger. Um, He, in the course of speaking with him on our lunch hours, um, he... From what I gathered, he was at Roswell, so he said. Um, He was 17, so that alerted me to the fact that he was born in 1930. So this must have been a fairly older fellow. Yeah, yeah. So in 77, I'm not, you know, let me see, 77, and he was born in 30. Well, you guys can do the math. I won't hold you up. That's fine. So anyway, um, during the course of the time that I was there, I only saw him maybe a dozen times. And um, what bothered me was the fact that he seemed like a very nice fellow, but there was something within his very being that he was fearful of. He did not want to speak of what he was doing. I asked him, well, you know, what do you do here? And he said, oh, I, you know, do this and that. But it wasn't happiness that he, you know, liked his job. He was very um, just fearful. You could you could tell that there was something going on that he didn't want to be a part of. Did you find out what that was? Well, um, when I asked him, I kind of trapped him when I asked him what he was doing. 
and he kind of hemmed and hawed about it. And then when I asked him again, he came out, I'm a geneticist. And then he stopped really short and said, I shouldn't have said that. And I said, so you're in the medical field. And he said, I'm a geneticist. Mm -hmm. I said, what is a geneticist doing on a naval base? And he just looked at me and gave me a look like, don't ask. Do not (sighs) say another word. And I said, okay, I'm not going to say another word. Right. So um, I didn't see him every day. There were weeks that would go by that I didn't see him. But one day um, he came out. I was sitting under the tree out in front having my lunch, and he came out and sat down. And I said, my God, where have you been? I haven't seen you in ages. Are you okay? He had this look of just mortal fear on his face, and he said, you have been seen talking with me. Watch your back. Just Great. be careful. Great. And me, you know, I've been into UFOs and all sorts of things my entire life. And, um, of course, with the cruise missile, Tomahawk and Sidewinder out there, the sightings were incredible. And there are so many stories to that, but I won't bore you to tears with those tonight. But um, no, stay with Roger. You, I mean, is, is there more? Do you, do you know what Roger was doing? Did you figure out what Roger well, was doing? I didn't know what Roger was doing, but he told me what he he gave me an idea of what he was doing at Roswell. Um, he said he was 17 years old. He had enlisted early. Um, back then, they didn't need the required documentation that they do now. So, if you were 14 or 15, you could enlist, and they wouldn't ask any questions. And he told me that he was doing um, guard duty on something that happened in Roswell. And he looked at me like, you don't need to know. All right, Kate, hold tight, and we'll finish Any more hints you can give us about? Definitely, Art. And I do apologize that this is such a lengthy story. That's okay. Go go right ahead. A lot I'm leaving out, but just the gist of it is... um, that was the last time I saw him, but in, during the conversation on my lunch hour, um, I let him know that I knew his name was not Roger, and I said, you, I know you feel that we're being watched, so why don't you just blink your eyes once for yes, twice for no. So the conversation was, you were at Roswell. He blinked once for yes. I said, the stories that we have heard over the 40-some-odd years, 50-some-odd years, are they all true? He blinked twice for no. I said, was there a crash of a UFO? He blinked once. The gist of it was that a little less than a fourth of the information that's out there is correct. He said the rest of it is not correct. Even a fourth ain't bad. Even a fourth ain't bad. And so I was being a, a, you know, a, a smart person. I won't say that on the air, but I said, did this creature like strawberry milkshakes, like we all heard heard about? And his face softened as though he was remembering a memory that actually made him happy, and he blinked once. Oh. And my zinger, you know, we all have our intuition. Well, I call mine my zinger, and my zinger went off, and I knew this man was there. I knew he was telling the truth, and I knew this man was scared. I never saw him again after that day. Um, to get the story going, um, during this next six months, various animals were found um, out in Inyokern, which is uh, west of China Lake, by about <clears throat> excuse me, about eight miles. Yes. Um, being the animal lover I am, um, it really bothered me when I heard some of these stories. Um, The first one was a rabbit, and this is pertinent to what I believe Roger was doing on the base. Sure. So some children, um, an 8-year-old, 9-year-old, and 11-year-old, they're all brothers, were out riding their bikes in Inyokern, where they lived, and they heard this horrible screaming sound, thought it was a cat. Well, they followed the sound and found a domestic rabbit, not a cottontail or a jackrabbit like you find out in the desert but a domesticated rabbit, and it had a partial head growing out of the back of its neck. Um, The mouth was clearly visible. It had one eye, and the rest of it, um, you could tell that it was like something trying to come out 
like a Harry Potter movie trying trying to come out of the back of its head, and it upset the boys so bad that one of the boys rode back, got his father. His father brought out a handgun, and once he saw it, he shot it, thinking it was just some environmental Horrid. mishap. Yes. Well, the kids didn't want to leave the rabbit, so they buried it. And the next day, they went back to put flowers on its grave and to say a small prayer because their father was in such a hurry to get him away from it that they found the carcass missing. It had been dug up by an animal. Great. Well, another um, cat was found, and it, this cat was fine. There was nothing wrong with it. It was not upset, hurt, or anything, but it had two tails. Two tails. Two tails. Roger's work. Could be. Could very well be. How many animals like that? Um, uh, my story's 18. I'm sure there's more than that. I'm 18 sure there's... animals in the mm-hmm. area. Uh, the biggest one um, was uh, some kids, some college kids, driving north on 395, heading towards Mammoth for a camping trip. They hit a dog. Um, the dog, they stopped, got out of the car. They said the dog had a leg growing out of its left flank and a leg growing out of its right flank. They said that the leg was half the, half the length of the dog's legs. They said the dog was a lab mix, a small, small lab mix. Um, they thought it was dead. They walked back to the car. Um, it was in the headlights. Walked back to the car to get a blanket because they just did not want to leave it at the side of the road. And on the way back with the blanket, it got up and looked at them and then ran off down into the desert, into the night. And they couldn't find it. They said they looked and looked and looked, but they never saw it. Oh, brother. So anyway, um, there were animals like this. Well, in the summer, uh, I had had a friend who was a police officer, and he called one night, and he said, you're not working on Friday night. Why don't you do a ride-along? And I'm like, hey, great, no problem. Ridgecrest is not really, you know, a big spot for a lot of excitement, so I thought, you know, what the heck. Sure. So we were having dinner, and we got a call. And some woman out in Inyo Kern, once again out in Inyo Kern, called and had complained about a week straight, saying that there was a bear going through her trash can. Mm -hmm. And she called, and nobody paid any attention. She said, I want somebody out here now. So they called my friend, and uh, we went out there, and he told me, you stay in the car. I'm like, yeah, right, sure. So I got out of the car with him. We walked around. She was the, out in Inyo Kern, there's mobile homes. There's not any houses, just to set the picture. There were three rows of mobile homes that went down about a mile. They're each on about an acre. And down at the very end of one of these little dirt roads um, was a big dumpster. And this woman was standing on the porch of her mobile home. Her dogs were in the front yard barking at this creature. And we went around. We heard this grunting noise go around the corner of the fence where the bush is, and we see what we thought was a bear. But there are no bears in the desert. But when it turned around, I could not believe my eyes. And my friend Daryl, just about, I I just... Try me. Give me the best (laughs) description. It was about seven feet tall. Daryl was about, he's been deceased for a while, but he was 6'3". So I know... This thing had to have been seven feet, about seven feet. It was upright like a man. It had greenish-brown fur all over it. It wasn't um, ape-like. It was definitely a male. And I don't think I need to tell you how I knew that, but um, it smelled terrible of blood, urine, feces. It, it was terrible, but it made no apparent action towards us. It It was like, oh, you know, audience, went back to dumpster diving. He pulled out a a sack of um, Carl's Jr. hamburger stuff (laughs) and was eating. He didn't care that we were standing there. the, The woman was standing there screaming at us, get that thing out of my garbage can. I'm sure. And So what did you do? So anyway, I just yelled at it. I said, hey. I mean, when it looked at me. 
I swear, it looked like it had human eyes. It, 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 they didn't glow red like an animal. It was acting kind of like a, a human that had been out in the forest for all of its life. And it made no, it didn't try to come at us. It didn't <clears throat> scream at us. It just grunted and was looking for food. It was just foraging. That's all it was doing. Then what? It just left? It just, the woman shot her shotgun up in the air because she didn't want it out there anymore. And the dogs were barking and it just lumbered off. It didn't run screaming off into the night. It so just lumbered off. So the bottom off. line to this story, Kate, is you believe that Roger and his friends yes. at China Lake. Yes. Uh, I do. We're conducting some kind of post-Roswell genetic research, and all these weird things were showing up in the desert. I really appreciate your story. Yes. May I, may I finish off? Yes. Okay. I never saw Roger again. That was in 1977. I ran across Roger in 1992 in San Diego. I was down visiting relatives and, at a supermarket, and I saw him shopping in a supermarket. Again, I called out Roger. He didn't turn around, so I went and tapped him on the shoulder, and he said, Oh, my God, you cannot be seen talking to me. He said, Kate, I'm supposed to be dead. You've got to get away from me. And I just, I was just kind of stunned, and it's very hard to stun me, and I didn't say much, and he turned around and walked away. In the year 2003, I hadn't seen or heard about Roger. I mean, it's not like we exchanged Christmas cards. Yeah. I received a phone call, I believe it was in August of 2003, from one of his friends. He said he was a friend of Roger's and that Roger had somewhat retired to his place in Connecticut or close to there. Okay, we're short on time now. Roger was murdered. He told me Roger was murdered, had been um, executed executed, um, kind of like mafia style, in his front living room. He didn't show up for his fishing uh, trip in the morning, and so his friend went to look for him, and um, they found him. He found him murdered. And it never hit the papers. Um, he said that what he called was a sweeper team, um, black vehicles showed up and removed his body, and nobody ever heard anything. There was no obituary or anything, and his friend said... He was leaving the country because he was fearing for his life. And you swear all of this is true, Kay? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you very, very much. You have a good night. That's, uh, that's Kay. Hello, Art Bell. This is Dean from Venice. Are you familiar with the program content of ABC Nightline for Friday night? Yes, I am, actually, Dean. This fax is to inform you of the topic for those of you that did not see it. I believe you'll find it interesting and hope you'll discuss it on your show. They covered alien life forms, mainly of microbiological and bacterial origin. They stated that a probe was sent to the moon before the Apollo mission. In that probe was a solar panel that an installation technici uh, technician sneezed on. The bacteria left on the panel was launched to the moon. The probe stayed on the moon for two years in a zero-oxygen, highly radioactive environment. When the Apollo-NASA mission retrieved the probe, they discovered the bacteria to be alive and active. Scientists are concerned that bringing soil samples back from Mars could contain microbial life forms that are not killed by the harsh environment of space. They spoke about the very real possibility that these life forms could have serious negative impact on Earth. If you have seen this Nightline segment, I would like to hear your opinion and ask you to open the topic for discussion. Yeah, sure. Dean, uh, by the way, thank you for the, uh, the facts, Dean. I think that's pretty good evidence that such a thing is indeed possible. And that if we bring back material objects, rocks, whatever, um, such a thing could occur. However, uh, bear in mind that the Earth is constantly being bombarded uh, by meteorites of various size, 
uh, many of which do not burn up in the atmosphere, one of which we now know contains microbial life from Mars. So if that danger was real, then we should have already been infected by, and perhaps are infected by, and one day will be infected by something from somewhere else that doesn't quite burn up completely in the atmosphere. So I would think the risk of bringing back something from Mars would be no bigger uh, than we, uh, we experience as a general basis as meteorites re-enter and make it. Just my thought. Give me an example of a case where, uh, for example, it was unseen, but there remained some physical evidence that we could, you know. Okay. Well, uh, one of the cases I go into occurred in 1948. And, of course, uh, as, as uh, we know, the abduction phenomenon did not really uh, become a public issue or known, really, uh, anywhere around the world in any great depth until the Betty and Barney Hill case came to light in 1966. Right. It occurred in 61. But we're talking now 48. This is uh, one year after Roswell. And in that particular case, uh, the, the woman I was dealing with was a, a very young child at the time, and she and her uh, brother were put down for naps in their uh, bedroom in the middle of the afternoon in Cincinnati, Ohio, by their mother, who I've had uh, been able to interview upon several occasions too. Mm -hmm. And uh, what <clears throat> uh, the mother and, and everyone recalled consciously, and I should point out incidentally that the uh, central figure in this case, the woman um, uh, who I have given a, a, a sue name to, uh, has had many, many abduction experiences the rest of her life, all kinds of issues. Uh, this is one that she didn't bring up to me at first because she she didn't know what to make of it and she couldn't remember the content of the abduction uh, consciously. But what she did remember uh, consciously, and her mother well remembered, is that the mother put them to bed uh, in their little bedroom on the second floor of a building uh, really in the suburbs of, of uh, Cincinnati. The next thing the mother uh, knew was that somebody came tearing up the stairs saying that the children were outside uh, on the ground at the basement of the cellar, uh, the cellar steps, uh, her children, both of them, and uh, that they must have fallen out the window. Huh. Uh, the mother went... Uh, Panic went tearing downstairs, and uh, the uh, this uh, central figure remembered that she sort of woke up and she couldn't move. She was lying on top of her brother at the foot of these basement steps, which incidentally were not underneath the, any of the windows from the right. bedroom. Right. Uh, they had no memory of falling. They were both paralyzed and unable to speak. Uh, they were rushed to the hospital by a totally panicked mother and uh, examined, and though they had fallen in effect because of the basement uh, steps where they were found on cement, they had fallen three stories. There was not a mark on either one of them. Uh -huh. nothing, no, nothing that had done any kind of damage, and yet they both remembered consciously uh, going floating out the window and some kind of huge shadow over the house, uh, and they couldn't remember exactly what happened consciously, but the point is that the doctor uh, and everyone else, of course, involved said there's no possible way these children could have fallen three stories onto cement, uh, which would have meant they would have had to have fallen at a diagonal instead of straight down yes. um, uh, without, you know, actually there's a very serious possibility that they would have been absolutely killed. They could not have survived, let alone yeah. not have a mark on them. Uh, under hypnosis, uh, the entire experience came up. Uh, the woman described uh, their being floated out the window, she and her little brother, and lifted up into the craft. And then when the experience was over, they were put down at this basement steps. Uh, and the brother remembers floating out the window. He doesn't remember. He, he doesn't want to undergo hypnosis, etc. But anyway, the basic point of all this is that it's, there's a great deal of material about this in the book. The point is that this happened in broad daylight in the middle of a suburban area with stores and, and buildings and everything around. Nobody saw a UFO. Nobody saw children come out a window, 
floating or falling or otherwise. Nobody heard any screams. There was no energy, uh, no uh, uh, kind of injury to any of the people involved. Uh, and that's the kind of case which implies invisibility, and yet we have cases we deal with in the book where it becomes a much more tangible thing. For yeah, instance, okay, we'll get to that in a second. I, I'm curious. Uh, that was a long time ago. Has there been any follow-up with these children since then? Well, uh, of course, I've been working with the mother, uh, who is now in her 50s, mm-hmm. and she has a child, uh, two children actually, who are uh, seemingly having abduction experiences uh, from time to time as if they are hmm. part of this ongoing uh, kind of uh, study of a particular bloodline. The brother, uh, who is now a man in his uh, late 50s, does not want to look into this and is still um, suffering from a great deal of fear connected with uh, his memory of that time of being paralyzed. When they were picked up and taken to the hospital, uh, rushed to the hospital, uh, they only regained the ability to move and speak uh, over a, a period of uh, between a half an hour and an hour. And again, there was no physical mark on them, no, no explanation of why they could not speak and why their bodies were paralyzed. That's remarkable. 